Welcome to this chess video, and this one will be sharing a little secret about the Sicilian defense. So let's simplify the Sicilian in a way that I think even beginners and intermediates can understand. So this here is the Sicilian defense, e4 and then c5. And with pawn to e5, the idea is mostly trying to prevent white from playing d4 and getting a nice pawn duo in the center. Of course, now c5 on the other hand does the exact same thing, but the benefit to c5 is you're not yet committing your central pawns. So these pawns have a little more flexibility, especially the e pawn here, which may go up one square to e6 or two squares to e5. Now, as we see, e5 is going to be the most likely candidate, but not always is that so easy to get in immediately. So what's this really big secret that actually makes the Sicilian a lot more simplified? And so that secret is actually, there is a lot of play over one color complex, the very important dark squares. Really, when most people think Sicilian defense, I think they think advanced or complicated, but really when I hear that, I usually think dark squares. And after this video, I think you'll realize just how much emphasis there is on black really fighting for the dark squares. We look on the very first move, c5. We are actually stopping white from playing d4. Again, fighting for dark square control. If we play the most popular variation here, where white develops, black plays on a d6, notice again, this pawn is actually controlling some valuable dark squares. They play d4, the open variation. We exchange on a dark square, they take back, and now we bring out this knight, developing move, and we are continuing to fight in this opening battle. Now really, knight f6 was kind of the first move that's actually not fighting for a dark square. As you may notice, this is controlling two light squares in the center. And I made a video specifically on why knight c3 and knight f6 is often played in Sicilian. So if you want to check that out, you can click the video link in the description. And so now here comes probably the main split where you really have to decide what variation to play. And now there's a lot of jokes about how complicated the knight orf variation is with pawn to a6. One of my favorites being this meme here. But the idea is actually very straightforward. The idea is we're putting a lot of influence over the b5 square. Credit against this video is a light square, but there's a very important reason why this is played. So back here, we actually want to be preparing pawn to e5. This is a dark square attacking this knight also on a dark square. Now, as you may sense, if this pawn move is played, the d6 pawn is oftentimes weak. And the biggest problem of playing e5 right away, although it is a variation, is bishop to b5 check. And now you actually have to block on d7 with a bishop or a knight. And in either of those cases, it is opening theory, but not really optimal for black. And so for this reason, we want to control this b5 square. And why pawn to a6 and the knight orf wants to control this square. So now the threat of playing pawn to e5 is actually on the table. And we will continue with the knight orf variation. But first, let me show a few different options that black can choose from here. And you'll see how all of these actually are fighting for the dark squares. Instead of pawn to a6, we can play the classical. One main line goes bishop to g5, pawn e6, with the idea that we'll put the bishop on e7, a dark square, to break the pin on this knight. White will probably play queen d2, bishop e7, and then castle and queen side. But we'll continue, but you see how, for most of our moves so far, black has been fighting over those dark squares. Following in line with what we were talking about earlier, regarding pawn to e6 instead of e5, if black tries to have a little bit more control in the center, a little bit more flexibility, they may play this move instead. But this is a little bit less popular today because of Paul Carez coming up with this Carez attack, very aggressive way of meeting the Shevenigan defense. And the point is very simple that they want to be pushing pawn g5 and kick this knight, and that's actually not so easy to deal with. Black can try and delay this, continuing the main line with pawn h6. But rook g1 if they really wanted to, support the d-pawn advancing. And then black can play the e5 that they were hoping for. In that variation, they actually invested two moves to play this pawn up, rather than one. But again, they are still fighting over the important dark squares. Another variation is they can try the dragon variation. And once again, we're looking at the dark squares. In this case, we're trying to get a bishop on the long diagonal and control all of those dark squares in the center. I could continue like this with the Yugoslav attack. And just like before, we'll have both sides castling opposite directions in this aggressive variation. Now g4 is actually one option here. Again, very theoretical. There is g4. Also, bishop c4 is the main idea. Perhaps even the more common main line. And then there's just castling right away. 
but I don't want to get into too deep theory here. Again, the focus of this video is not memorization of opening theory, but to show how much play is on the dark squares and some of the main ideas of the Sicilian defense to help you simplify and perhaps consider playing this yourself. Now I did promise to go back to the Night Orf variation, and so with a6 here, we can continue in the spirit of the opening that we've just looked at. Where they can continue developing, we get the pawn e5 that we wanted, now without fear of a check on b7. We kick their knight back, we develop trying to simply get castled while also helping to defend these dark squares, and the game will continue from here. Now in a lot of these opening lines of the Sicilian defense, especially the classical lines, it is very common for black to want to get the queen to c7, sometimes to a5, and in both cases look at all of these dark squares that we're actually looking at. And so it really helps to understand some of the main ideas of each opening. And I want to bring back to the very start here, and show one other very important detail that it goes in line with the dark squares we were talking about. Notice that the difference with c5 instead of e5, although both of them are fighting for the dark d4 square, is also where we're choosing to gain space. If we start with pawn e5, the game is symmetrical, and we're clearly fighting for the center. But with c5, we're having a little extra queenside space. And the reason I mention this queenside space is when we continue with the knight or variation that we looked at, it is very common for black to actually expand long term and play pawn b5. And so the reason for this is actually in line with what we were saying earlier, in this case securing more of that queenside space. We are controlling two light squares, but if white isn't careful, at the right time they may be able to get play this move, and now you're controlling some dark squares again. Now I don't want you to have tunnel vision and only think of half of the board, in this case the dark square color complex. And keep in mind this is only a guideline for the opening stage. But I think seeing some of this from the dark score perspective might help clarify what you should be playing for in this particular opening. I know a lot of beginners especially shy away from openings they fear as being really advanced. Sometimes even openings like e4, e5 a lot of beginners shy away from because they fear of how much opening theory there is and all the possibilities that white and black can choose from. And so for this and many other reasons, the Sicilian very rarely a choice for beginners. But if you know some of these simple ideas, it is by all means playable. And in my opinion, I actually like most mainline openings as beginner choices, because the presence of mainlines helps you later look up after the game, whereas if you pick obscure openings or sidelines, it might not always be so obvious why one move is preferred over another. Thanks for stopping by everyone, I'll see you in the next chess video.